Thank you. Continuing on to roll call. Yes, thank you. Commissioner Lopez. Here. Chair Sanchez. Present. Commissioner Quill. Here. Commissioner Wolbert. Here. Commissioner Jaramillo. Here. And Commis uh, Vice Chair Jones. Present. Thank you. Um, Commissioners Guerrero, Liang, and Chang are excused. We have quorum. Thank you, Stephanie. Continuing on to the administration of oath. Is there anyone wishing to speak on a matter that is not on the agenda? If we could have you everyone stand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you are about to give before this body will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, please say I do. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Um, continue on to public uh, comments. Items on the agenda. Continue on to the consent agenda. Oh, public comments. Do we have people who want to? Yes. Hi, Hank Mitchell, Vertimont. Um, <laughs> I've been here in the past talking to you about parcel and lot sizes. And some projects have been approved sub size to what the zone requires. And that one acre has been coming through at 39,000 and a 10-8 coming through. They're all 10% reductions. Uh, you discussed ADUs, and now you have a new one called AB68. This one here, if I understand it right, I may be corrected, that it allows three habitable dwellings per parcel or lot, which pretty much eliminates a single-family dwelling in the state of California. We have some projects coming into the foothills. We just went through the North Park fire, which reminded us of the panorama and the old fire. The old fire got me. Got a lot of, I, got, I don't know if they're here tonight, but they lost their home. But high density housing in the foothills is a scary thing. And you've allowed some reductions in lot sizes to already increase the density in the foothills, high fire areas, specifically Vermont. With AB 68, a developer can come to you, say he's going to build three on that lot, or with an ADU, he can build two. You can't refuse it, you can tell him how to build it but you can't refuse it, doubling or tripling the density. And Spring Trails is one of those projects you've allowed not only to go from one acre, you've allowed to go down to 10 eight, quarter acre. If he wants to, he can come back and restart that thing and put three houses on each of those quarter acres. You can't stop him. I'm asking you to stand your ground in a zone. If it says one acre, make it 43.5. If it says quarter acre, 10 eight, make it 10 eight because every 10% he cuts down, good for him, that's another house in 10. He's making good money. But it's not a topographical thing. It's a dollar trail. What we're looking at is density. Most of the people in Vermont can't get fire insurance now. Maybe you all don't know that. These new homes being built up there, I don't know what fire insurance is going to cost them. And I don't know if, uh, as far as traffic goes and all that, the city hasn't got infrastructure to support it. Now, I want to go back to density. That's all I'm asking you tonight. Stand your ground. If any of you don't know the area, go out and look at it. No research, please. A lot of you don't even know where, what some of the topograph of Vermont is. I don't know half of what the other wards are because I don't go out there. If I sat in that seat, I would go out there and check each project that came through here. But please, in the foothills, and I'm not talking about just Vermont, across the foothills, be careful on that density. Hold, stand tall on the size of the lot parcel. Don't reduce it. You're just increasing the density. And this North Park fire scared the bejesus out of us. We were already, I built my own fire truck. I had hoses all over the property. My wife was packing to leave. It would have given us two days before it got to us by the old panorama fire. But I'll tell you what, that's a scary thing to go through. Thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. We're going to continue on to the consent calendar. Um, does staff have an update for us? Yes, good evening, commissioners. On the consent calendar this evening, we have the uh, requ recommended for the conditions, or excuse me, approval of the minutes for the meeting of October the 8th of 2019. They are complete as submitted. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Um, is there anyone wishing to speak on the consent calendar items? 
If not, may I entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar? I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar as read into the record. I second. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? The motion passes. Continuing on to public hearing items, uh, the Planning Commission will first hear a report from staff and then the public hearing will be opened. The applicant will have an opportunity to speak. Next, members of the public will be allowed to speak. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak must be sworn in and also fill out a request to speak form. The forms are located on the table near the door. When your name is called, come forward and speak into the microphone. Say and spell your name and give your address for the tape record. After all have spoken, the applicant will ha be allowed to respond. The public hearing will then be closed and the Planning Commission will begin deliberations and make a decision. All actions except general plan amendments and amendments to the Municipal Development Code are final actions unless an appeal is filed and a fee paid within 15 days to the Community Development Department. If you challenge the resultant action of the Planning Commission in court, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at the public hearing described in this agenda or in written correspondence delivered to the Community Development Department at or prior to the public hearing. Uh, continuing on to item number two, if we could have the staff report. Yes, good evening, Commissioners. <clears throat> item number two is Conditional Use Permit 1903. The proposed project is to develop, establish, and operate an 80-foot tall monopine telecommunications facility consisting of nine antennas within a 1,500-square-foot ground-mounted equipment enclosure on a parcel containing approximately 3.61 acres owned by the First Baptist Church of San Bernardino. It is located 2,000 feet east of the 215 freeway at 4747 North State Street within the residential suburban zone. Here we have a location map of the proposed project site. We have the aerial map showing the location. The site was selected based on an analysis conducted by T-Mobile radio frequency engineers. They based it on no service coverage, insufficient, insufficient coverage, capacity during high cell usage, and quality of the signal. Utilizing a monopole or excuse me, a monopine for the purposes of co-location co and compatibility <coughs> would allow for more carriers to co-locate on the facility and ensure a compatible look with the existing landscape in the vicinity. Associated ground-mounted equipment will be located within an existing equipment enclosure, stepped back 70 feet from the property line, access via a locked access gate. It would operate quietly and virtually noise-free, landscaped accordingly, and screened adequately from the public right-of-way. Access to the proposed facility will be taken from North State Street and will not impede any traffic. The facility is unmanned and only requires periodic maintenance of the site equating to about once a month and will last no longer than two hours during normal business hours. <clears throat> the proposed project meets all development standards and provides infrastructure provides for long-term growth in that the project benefits include 5G ready and compatible, higher data transfer rates, enhanced coverage applicable for emergency calls in that area, higher, higher security and privacy for telephone users, and meets the general plan goals and policies. Here we have the existing site looking south to the 210 freeway. We have the existing site looking north towards Cal State San Bernardino. We have the existing site looking east. Here we have the site plan here is the parent parcel. There is an existing church on the parcel. This will be where the enclosure is located, taking access from North State Street. Here we have the parking and turnaround where they could do the periodic maintenance. This would be the entire equipment enclosure blown up. We have our elevations. The proposed T-Mobile uh, center line would be here about 50 feet where they could also add a future carrier at the 65 foot mark and also another future carrier at the 75 foot mark. Here we have the landscape. Um, it will be integrated to screen the project and will be maintained. The landscape includes installation of five like pine trees, which you see here. 
for compatibility for Japanese box trees, which are up here, and um, trumpet vines, which would ultimately cover the enclosure itself, along with 214 square feet of ground cover, ensuring proper screening. So you can see the trumpet vines, and they would completely cover the enclosure. Here we have the conceptual site looking south towards the 210 freeway, looking south future, looking north to Cal State USB conceptual, and then another future shot showing the landscape grown out. And recommendation, Planning Commission adopt resolution number 2019-064 adopting the category of exemption and approving conditional use permit 19-03 based on the findings of fact and subject to the recommendations of uh, conditions of approval. Uh, I could take any questions if you have any for me. And the applicant is here to uh, answer questions as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, I'm going to open public hearing for item number two. Is there anyone wishing to speak on this item? No, I don't see anyone wishing to speak. Um, I will close public hearing and I just want to make a comment that this is great because it will really benefit the public. I mean, emergency contact is really important, especially in this area where the wind and yes, everything. It is. So. Perfect. Um, I will entertain a motion for item number two. I'd like to make a motion to approve agenda item number two. Do we have a second? I'll second that. <coughs> Perfect. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? The motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Moving on to item number three, conditional use permit 19-05. Perfect. Thanks. <coughs> it's a proposed project is to develop, establish, and operate an 80-foot tall mono elm telecommunications facility supporting nine antennas within a 596 square foot ground mounted equipment enclosure on a parcel containing approximately 1.17 acres owned by Marco Sierra of Fontana, approximately 300 feet west of the 215 freeway located at 896 North Harris Street within the industrial light zone. Here we have the location map of the proposed project site. Here is the aerial map of the project site. Again, the site analysis or the analysis was based on um, analysis conducted by T-Mobile radio frequency engineers based on the no service coverage, insufficient coverage, capacity during high cell usage and quality of the signal, utilizing a mono alum for the purpose of co-location and compatibility, which would allow for two more carriers to co-locate on the facility and ensure appropriate landscape in the vicinity. Associated ground mounted equipment would be installed located within an equipment enclosure, stepped back 30 feet from the property line and lined up with the existing building, accessed via an access gate, and would operate quietly and virtually noise free and landscaped accordingly and screened adequately from the public right of way. Access to the proposed facility will, take, will be taken from North Harris Street and will not impede any traffic. The facility is also unmanned and only requires periodic maintenance of the site, site equating to about once to twice a month and it will last no longer than two hours during the normal business hours. The proposed project meets all development standards and provides in infrastructure that provides for long-term growth and that the project benefits include the 5G ready and compatible, higher data transfer rates, enhanced coverage applicable for all emergency calls in that area, higher security and privacy for telephone users and meets the general plans, goals and policies. We have the existing site looking north towards West 9th Street, existing site looking south towards West 8th Street, existing site looking east towards the 210 freeway, existing site looking northwest towards North J Street. If I would have went straight west, it would have just been the, bu the buildings. Here is the site plan. You can see we have the proposed mono elm, proposed equipment enclosure, the proposed turnaround for the maintenance taken off of Harris Street. We have the blown up site plan where they will be adding a wrought iron fence. We have the elevations, T-Mobile center line at 50 feet, future carriers at 65, and another future carrier at 75. This is what the top of the mono am would look like. So you can see it's pretty well uh, 
covered in, in stealth. We have the landscaping, which will be integrated to screen the project and will be maintained. The landscape includes installation of two like Chinese elm trees, which are here. Uh, for a compatibility purpose, six pine trees and 27 Japanese box trees. Again, the trumpet vines will be uh, utilized uh, along the enclosure to completely screen it, along with 14,000 uh, square feet of ground cover ensuring proper screening. Here is an example of the mono elm. We have one in the city of Winter Haven, which is Imperial County, California. And then we have another one in the city of Angel, which is Imperial County, California as well. We have our conceptual site looking towards 9th Street. You can see the wrought iron. See, they painted all the graffiti up, cleaned up the site, applicable landscaping. They also landscaped uh, the access points. And here we have the future conceptual of what it would look like in coming years. And then we have a conceptual looking east, so it kind of blends in there really well. <coughs> And our recommendation is planning commission adopt resolution uh, number 2019-065, adopting the categorical exemption and approving conditional use permit 19-05 <coughs> based on the findings of fact and subject to the recommended conditions of approval. Thank you. That concludes my report and I can take any questions and the applicant is also here to take questions. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this point, I'll open public hearing for item number three. Is there anyone wishing to speak on this item? No? All right. Um, I do have a comment. Oh, I have a question. Yes. What is there now in that lot? Is it vacant? It is a vacant lot, vacant. yes. So where would the landscaping go? So around the tower itself or around, around the tower the itself within the 40 by 40 enclosure, just into the frontage of where it's being uh, installed. But they are also adding the wrought iron gate and, and cleaning up the site really well. All along the property, around along, the property, along the all property, along the property. And, and so then the landscaping would be along the fence close to just the, the tower. Yes, just in the, close to the enclosure, the tower, and the access point so that it would allow for future development. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I was actually going to comment on that as well. The project, um, like the prior one, there's a little worse for wear. Uh, so I just wanted to know what clarify the maintenance that was going to be done around the area. But, all right, perfect. Uh, since there's no one else wishing to speak on this item, I will close public hearing and I will entertain a motion. I'd like to make a motion approving agenda item number three. I'll second that motion. Uh, we have a motion. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Moving on to item number four. If we could have the staff report, please. Item number four is for development permit type B, 18-06. Uh, this is a proposal for a 51-unit mobile home park for seniors on a parcel containing approximately 6.79 acres within the residential medium RM zone. Um, this is located just uh, north of the Walmart um, on, uh, on the east uh, end of Highland Avenue um, off of Boulder um, and just below the Mountain Shadows uh, mobile home park community. Um, each of the 51 units will be equipped with a garage. There will also be 51 um, guest parking spaces, um, a clubhouse with a pool and spa is proposed. Um, and again, this is for um, seniors age 55 and up. Um, of the 51 units, approximately 28 of them will be single wide and 23 of them will be double wide. Um, the units themselves will be individually owned, um, but the lots that they're placed on will be leased. Uh, this is just a little bit uh, north of the area, kind of the entrance to Mountain Shadows. Um, the project itself will be basically just south of the image that you see there. Um, and that's it. So great view of San Gregonio right there. Um, 
and then that's the back side of the Walmart shopping center. Uh, again, 51 units proposed. There will be a clubhouse uh, with a pool and spa, 51 guest parking spaces, um, and all of the other amenities required. Um, here's just kind of a typical um, standard view of what the mobile homes might look at, look like. Um, but then each of the individual owners has the option to um, upgrade and customize the unit um, as necessary. Um, and here's just some of the examples. They can, you know, put in laminate flooring, granite countertops. They can pick the um, color of the roof shingle, um, the color of paint, decking materials, um, cabinet uh, materials and colors, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, here's just a <coughs> preliminary view of what uh, the clubhouse will look like. And that concludes my presentation. Um, our recommendation is that the Planning Commission adopt Resolution 19, uh, sorry, 2019-68, uh, adopting the Mitigated Negative de Declaration and Mitigation Monitoring and Reporting Program and approving development permit type P18-06 based on the findings of fact and recommended conditions of approval and appropriate mitigation measures. I can take any questions. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, I hereby open public hearing for item number four. Uh, we do have some people who wish to speak. Uh, if we could have Ava Hazard come up. Anybody at all looking to speak on this item, if I could please have you stand and I'll have you take the oath all at once. Everybody raise their right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you are about to give before this body will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, please say I do. Thank you. You could state your name and address for the tape record. Oh yes, Eva Hazard, uh, 4040 East Piedmont, uh, space number four, Highland, California, uh, 92346. Anything else? No. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. I am the community manager at Mountain Shadows Senior Mobile Home Community, which just sits <coughs> right as you saw our entrance in this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, we're not here to say yay or nay, but we feel like we need more information and more, more information. We just received the packet that was sent out or the notice like last Friday and it came to my desk like on Tuesday and we've been trying to gather information so that we know kind of what, what's going on. So in the short time that we've had, there's been a lot of questions and inconsistencies across all of the different documents that, that we read different sizes, different shapes, all these things. So we just had a lot of questions. Uh, we really, as I said, we haven't had a lot of time to really critique it, but it appears the majority of the proposed homes are half the size of our smallest mobile home in Mountain Shadows and certainly smaller than any of the single family homes in the neighborhood. So our question is how is it that these homes can be compatible in scale and massing as homes and mobile homes in existing development, i.e. the single family homes? Uh, we noted a lot of inconsistencies in the different proposals and plans between September, October, November in size, number, how big the home was, square footage, um, the carport structure, the garages, so it was confusing for us. From the site maps and the elevation drawings like you were just showing us, the floor plans included in the packet all appear to be the exact same model, Canyon Lakes made by Fleetwood Homes in Riverside. The drawing shows all of the homes almost identical, cookie cutter, the roofs, the windows, everything. So they kind of give the appearance of rows of shoe boxes lined up in a row. In Mountain Shadows, a single white home isn't even allowed. Our smallest home is a double. We wanted to uh, inquire as the plan to kind of achieve the architectural differences that you would see in a normal neighborhood uh, in this, you know, um, in this community because when you see the site maps and the elevation drawings they all look identical. Um, so we were just kind of wondering would 
further study take place to add maybe um, to the conditional use permit perhaps another model or two so that there was a little bit of diversity in the community making it match the surrounding uh, neighborhoods single-family homes um, we just uh, we could be supportive of a project if it was consistent more so with existing size of the mobile homes in the area and the single-family homes but for what we can see everything appears to be that's not the case less than half the size uh, it just seems I know our residents had a lot of questions too in terms of okay what is the sales price range of the homes what will the space rents be uh, I don't know if those are known but we just urge further study and not passing it immediately. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I could just speak briefly um, to the fact that um, the plans look to be cookie cutter at the moment. Um, that is because the individual property owners, once they buy the unit, will be able to um, customize them as they want. So right now, this is just kind of the, the models that they are um, proposing. Um, as far as rents and, and leasing space, we do have um, the project applicant here, so they may be able to speak to that a little bit more. Perfect. Thank you. Um, if we could have Jim Klein. Good evening. Uh, if I could have you state your name and your address for the tape record. Jim Klein, 4040 Piedmont Drive, uh, Highland, California. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, there are many intangibles uh, as to the effect that this proposed development uh, will have on the immediate and uh, the surrounding area. One example uh, would be will the crime rate go up? But there's one thing that is predictable, and that's the traffic situation will be a problem. And here's why. Eastbound traffic on Piedmont will empty into southbound traffic on Piedmont because Piedmont turns right there. And there's a stop sign at the corner where no one ever stops. They round the corner southbound at 10, 15 miles an hour, and most never look north to see whether or not there are cars exiting mountain shadows. These same vehicles will now have an additional problem to deal with, and that's vehicles leaving the entrance exits of the new development. So then you have southbound traffic leaving mountain shadows, along with south on westbound traffic exiting the new development and vehicles from both exits going either north and then west on Piedmont or southbound on Piedmont. And this whole thing is further complicated by visibility problems for traffic created by the curves and turns on southbound Piedmont, Piedmont Drive. <clears throat> That's along with a great number of trucks in and out of the service road that borders the new development on the south and which provides access to those businesses immediately south of that. In other words, there are five traffic flows all emptying into what is essentially <clears throat> a residentially sized street. Believe me, it will be a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Diane Murphy. Diane Murphy, 4040 Piedmont Drive, Space 11. Highland, California, 92346. I agree with what Jim says. I agree with what Eva says. There is going to be 51 units in there. They are single wides or possibly some double wides. There's not a whole lot of alter altering you can do to those small units. You can do it inside, but outside you're pretty limited to address that. 
The one, one of the things I'm concerned with was the dirt and the dust, the air pollution from the vehicles, 51 residents in there. Their visitors come. If they're seniors, they're going to have children, grandchildren coming in. The traffic flow, the noise. You can put up a barrier wall, but no barrier wall is going to stop that dirt coming up the dust. We have traffic problems. You come down that street, all of a sudden out comes a huge truck delivering to Walmart or cars that are using that to get into the center. There's a curve there. That entrance is right there. You come around that curve and all of a sudden there's somebody there. There's a problem there. There's a problem with the traffic flow. Regular flow is going to be a problem, but also if we have an emergency, people come out of Mountain Shadows. We have over 300 units in there that we're going to be evacuating. Depending upon what evacuation, we're going to have law enforcement, we're going to have fire trucks coming in and out, and this, this thing is going to be dumping onto Piedmont also. I realize you have another exit, but Piedmont will be very congested. Noise travels. I don't care about the barrier wall. Noise travels up. Mountain Shadows is going to get a lot more noisy. We have a southwest wind prevails every afternoon. If you live in San Bernardino, you know that. Sometimes it's brisk. If there's a fire, those embers are going to come right up into mountain shadows. And we are a mobile home community. We're going to burn. I have a very big concern about that. I think that the city council and everyone should take care of their constituents, their voters. That is what you're here for, your residents. I agree that people can make a living and do investments, but I think this investment is not good for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Dennis? Lifts? Oh, Denise, sorry. Um, my name is Denise Ufkis. I live at 2695 Sane Avenue in Highland. Um, my home is one of the ones that's within 500 feet of the proposed development off of Piedmont. I've lived there for 25 years and raised my family there. Um, the current proposal for a new mobile home park has raised several concerns for me and I recommend that it be tabled until a later meeting so that questions can be answered and issues addressed. I generally agree with what has been said before me. Um, this project is at the entrance to our neighborhood and will have an impact on everyone who enters from Piedmont as it will visually set the tone for the area so it has the possibility of affecting property values on much more than just the people notified within 500 feet. Um, this page 117 of the agenda said that the proposed mobile home park is consistent with the existing adjacent land uses which include another similar mobile home park and single family residential neighborhood. I respectfully disagree. The proposed homes are significantly smaller than those already in the area. The nearby single family homes are typically 1,900 to 2,400 square feet. Homes currently listed in mobile homes, the Mountain, Mountain Shadows community range from 1,344 to 1,690 square feet. Um, more than half of these proposed homes would be single wides with only 840 square feet. Um, the proposal contains nothing about adding variety to the, to the exteriors. I realize you've talked a little bit about that, but they still look like boxes to me. It is also unclear to me whether the garages are carports or some combination. Um, on one page it says it's an enclosed garage. On another page in the agenda it says it's, it's partially enclosed. Um, my backyard is adjacent to the existing Mountain Shadows mobile home community and they have been excellent neighbors for the 25 years that I've lived there. They are a gated community with 24-7 security and they are a 55 and over community with no exceptions. This proposal represents as a park of a 55 plus community, yet on page 173 of the full agenda, it indicates they intend to allow residents as young as 21 years of age. So it is only nominally a senior community. Um, therefore, I would like to oppose this proposal as presented until the following can be addressed. Provide a guarantee that this will be a 55 plus only community in perpetuity with no one younger than 55. Um, provide a plan with specifics for ongoing park security, preferably around the clock. Provide a plan for preventing it from becoming a park of rentals and absentee and landlords. Require that the homes be lot la la larger, more in keeping with the existing mobile home park that all homes should be double wide and have a home-like facade facing the street. Provide clarity on the garage carport issue. Address concerns 
as expressed for the traffic on the curves of Piedmont, because the entrance is going to be right on the curve. Give more time for nearby residents to learn about the project and comment on it, especially those beyond who 500 feet, and notify those residents by mail that typically would be entering the neighborhood from Piedmont. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, do we have any response to uh, in terms was that, of was that all of our, our mm -hmm. public comments? Mm -hmm. um, uh, oh no, we do have a we do have do a few we? more, but okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have the the applicant developer. I think would like to maybe say a few words. Perfect. All right. Um, yeah. We do have. Yeah. Evening. My name is Leo Fuller. 522 Myrtlewood Drive, Cala Mesa. I'm a mobile home dealer involved with the project. I'm a 33-year veteran of the mobile home industry. I also brought uh, my dear friend who is the factory manager of the Fleetwood factory out in Riverside. So we're going to answer technical questions if you'd like. However, let me say that in the last three years, I've sold more new homes in the last three years than I have in the prior 30, 30 years before that. And the reason why is because a lot of these older homes are reaching points of obsolescence. Homes today are made with crust egg floors, hardy, wood, hardy board wood siding, eaves, PVC2 piping. They're a very superior product, and they qualify for even Calvet financing. Most seniors I have done business with for 33 years can't afford anything as neat as Mountain Shadows, and it is a very nice park. But this, is a, this park is, the rents are going to be between 500 and 650, which is far more affordable. The rents are going to be make provisions for senior 55 and recognizing the fact that we have a changing demographic where a lot of 55 year olds are married to 35 year olds. Where a lot of grandmothers have caretakers who are their grandchildren who are 28, 30 years old. The fact that we're not allowing children in is because we don't want to cause an adverse effect to the area or cause any problems with crime. These homes are not cookie cutter, but they are state of the art. We can gussy them up, we can do all sorts of new stuff, but I, w I wouldn't even begin to tell you that we could match the fine homes in Mountain Shadows because that park was designed under a different concept. These are actually affordable homes that, is, that are desperately needed for this area. And that most of my, in fact, that most of my sales are these homes from anywhere from the San Diego up to Vacaville she tells me that these people are enjoying Now, these are 15 wides, the single ones are 15 wides. They're not little 10 wides, and I won't give the impression they're little ca cracker boxes. These are 15 wide homes that are very nice, and they're very useful, and they're very well built. They're designed to last for 80 years or more because of the construction. They're designed to be, to be fire retardant, and they're also going to be designed to be ADA friendly. In other words, wider doors for wheelchairs, wheelchair ramps, that type of thing. I can appreciate the discussion about what's going on around the area, but we are moving into the future where people need affordable housing. And quite, quite frankly, the average manufacturer, a little single wide, with a today in today's market, is going to run between sixty-five to eighty thousand bucks alone. And we're, and people and people are dying, are starving for affordable housing where they can get easy financing. And the problem right now is that a lot of the older homes, you just can't get financing. And a lot of these and these homes are designed specifically for quiet living. The developers that I'm working with have made it very clear they want it to be a quiet. And there are going to be some very strict rules there. So, honestly speaking, this is, a, this is a, a boost to the neighborhood, not a detractor. Especially when you look at the, the product being, these homes could be, would be, could be approved for placement on a permanent foundation on land. These are not homes that were made under the convoluted mobile home RV laws back in the, back in the earlier days. They're very well built. They will be very conforming to the area as far as what, the, what their amenities are, what their features are. And they really give people an opportunity to buy something new where they can get financing, and even more important, be able to sell it and get financing for the area. So granted, the, our neighbors are, have mansions. That is not the philosophy. If you were to do a, a measure of what's being sold throughout Southern California, you're going to see a trend towards 15 wides, 24 by 56s, 24 by 48s. I think trying to compare this for development what was done with a whole different thought process would not be fair. So I urge this thing to be developed. I, have, I can answer any questions. The manufacturer, general manager of factories right here. And as far as the external decorum, we can say 
A lot of good things we can tell a lot of banks, but they will be safe, they'll be affordable, and they'll be places where people will want to live. And so to answer, again, but I'm going to reemphasize the fact that this is going to be a 55-year park, year old park, but I'm not going to say no to some gentleman who married a woman who's 46 years old that she can't live there. That's ridiculous. I'm not going to say to an 85-year-old grandma who's got a 32-year-old grad student daughter who's her caretaker, you can't live there. This is the new demographic that we're moving into as a community, as, a, as an industry throughout Southern California. We have to look forward, not look back. I appreciate their concerns. I really appreciate what the, what the, how eloquent they've been, but we've got, I've got to keep reminding you that this is the way of the future. We need affordable housing in this area. We need veteran housing in this area. We need housing that can get financed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, James? Penman? Thank you, James Penman, 221 East Marshall Boulevard, San Bernardino. Um, could we put the site plan back up, please? Thank you. Uh, when I was city attorney, we were always concerned about this particular parcel because it is a prime area for low income, ho for low -income housing. This proposal is not low income, it's affordable housing, and there's a significant difference. And I remember dealing with this constantly. We know this parcel is going to be at some point built out. That's going to happen. The law does not permit the city to prohibit any type of um, use of a, a property. There's only two things this property is suited for. One is low income, uh, high density housing. The other is mobile home parks. Um, I thought long and hard before uh, uh, getting involved in this particular case. I still live in San Bernardino, plan to stay here the rest of my life, unlike some politi ex-politicians who fled. Um, really um, have a lot of empathy for the people up there. Uh, I was pleased to see that veterans can uh, get VA homes, uh, uh, VA loans to purchase these homes. At 65 to 80,000, I, I think they're going to um, be good people that are going to be living there. I don't see the kind of people that I dealt with as city attorney prosecuting uh, moving in there in terms of the, the crime rate. Um, anytime you have more traffic in an area, anytime you have more housing in an area, you're going to have more traffic. However, there have been careful traffic uh, uh, work done on this particular project. The fire department and police department went over it. Uh, we've been working on it for over two years now. I personally met with the fire inspector, spent quite a bit of time uh, talking about fire hydrants and uh, egress and ingress. Um, my concern is that if this project does not go ahead and we have a developer now who's willing to, to build it and they intend to have a, a, obviously a, a, a local management and the developer is local, um, I think what's going to go there, and I think something will, because the city continues to grow in population, it's going to be low-income housing. And if somebody comes in with low-income housing for apartments, and you've already turned down mobile home parks, you're going to have a pretty hard time legally turning down low-income apartments there. Um, I think it's a good use of that property. I think the, pro the fire department thinks the property is a, is a fire hazard right now. Um, or at least was until uh, the current owner bought it, and I understand there's been some uh, grading done, or not grading, but uh, clearance of brush. Uh, I went up there a year ago. I haven't been up there recently, so I don't know if it's, you know, what the brush situation is. But given the aggressiveness of our, of our fire department, I would be surprised it's overgrown. I guess I'm out of time, so uh, thank you very much. If there's any questions, I'll be pleased to try to answer them. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Penman. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on this item that didn't fill out a slip? No? All right. Any comments from the commissioners? Uh, through, through the chair, I have a question about Mr. Penner. Um, Jim, wasn't this, this is not a new project. This project's been worked on for a long time. It's been um, on for many, really a number of years. Um, I think there was a, a hiccup uh, three or four years ago, but for the, over two years now, we've been processing this through the planning pipeline. Um, 
I'm disappointed to hear that the good folks at Mountain Shadows weren't informed earlier because uh, there were notices sent out. I know the tribe uh, looked at it. They had some questions. Those were answered, and they didn't have any objections. Fire, after we agreed to what they wanted, they didn't have any objections. Um, so I'm a, I'm a little surprised. To, I, I know that there was a conversation, I'm told. Let me get my notes. that uh, Bob Roberts, one of the people involved in the project, spoke to someone, and I'm told, I don't have any first-hand knowledge of this, to someone in a management position at, at um, Mountain Shadows over two years ago um, and asked questions about what the rent was at Mountain Shadows and what the costs of the homes were mm -hmm. and, and information like that. In order to build, it needs to be um, uh, cost-effective, obviously, for the developer. It's a, it's a lot. Um, it's low-income housing can get government subsidies. They can get special government loans, and that's what concerns me about this parcel. Is I could see someone coming in, who doesn't have the money to develop a, a mobile home park, even if it's not quite the same as Mountain Shadows, but does have the money through through government loans and government programs to get low-income housing there. Um, so yes, to answer your question, the project has been on the books for quite a while. I know I've been involved with it for a couple of years. Um, and I was assured that the notices were going out. Um, so I'm a little surprised that if, if people just uh, were recently informed. I was told that um, um, the my recollection is that uh, Mountain Shadows was a, um, Mr. Stubblefield owned it. And I was told that um, his daughter called um, uh, one of the city council members today and wanted to know why they just found out about it. So I don't fully understand that because there's been a lot of activity up there. And uh, like I say, I can't personally verify that that um, Bob Roberts spoke to the someone in management there. But I also have no reason to doubt it because they were, I know they were they wanted to find out what the um, cost of the mobile homes was up there. I think the people that they're looking to put in there are going to be uh, are going to be good people. I, I don't think they're going to be the kind of people that will contribute to crime. Uh, I, I, I always agree. If you put new housing in, you're going to you're going to have more cars, but you're going to have more cars if you put apartments in there too. Through the, Thank you. Through the chair, I have a question of staff. Um, the notifications go out to this just on a radius, correct? In other words, a radius of the project? As with, yes. As with all projects, we send the, um, the notices, public hearing notice, um, 10 days prior to the, uh, to the meeting date. And, those, and we also p publish a, uh, in the newspaper, public notice in the paper. The, uh, the mailers go out to the uh, property owners within 500 feet of the site. Correct. And again, so those, those go out 10 days in advance. The agendas are posted the, the, the Friday before, before the meeting okay. or, or the Thursday. Usually, and the fire department and some of the other departments have looked at this. And yes, with, yeah. again, with all projects, it goes through our DERC process. Fire department um, did play a, a role in this, particularly with as it relates to the secondary access. Okay. And um, <coughs> yes. Okay. To to address some of the questions some of the speakers had uh, about the garages, are they garages or carports, or are they half and half, or what? It, they're they're partially enclosed, so they're they're more consistent with a carport, but they do have paneling on the outside. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ma'am, can we have you come up to the microphone, please? My apologies to cut you off, Denise. You know, you're talking about this project's been in the planning for years, but why are we just finding out 10 days before the meeting, 10 days, and also on a holiday weekend? So, I mean, most people didn't even have time to research it. It wasn't posted till Thursday on the website with the details, and the details have conflicts in them, um, as with the garage carport thing, and don't have enough details in areas. So obviously, people have been talking about this for a long time, but those of us who live there haven't been consulted all this time and have had no say in it. 
Um, the second thing is you were talking about that there weren't other alternatives for this land. I actually floated the, a usage of this land years ago when um, Neil Derry was the Ward 4 councilman. Um, I suggested that we needed parks on our end of town. Um, we're always totally ignored when it comes to parks and libraries on the east end. And that, to me, is an excellent use of that property, would keep it green and also not a fire hazard. So, I mean, that's also a possibility. Thank you. If I could speak to that, the city's parks are pretty much broke. Um, <laughs> they are. They're pretty, much, they're pretty much broke. And even before the city went bankrupt, the city's parks were not in, in good condition. Um, the landowner is not going to donate the land for a park. The landowner bought it as, as an investment, just as Mountain Shadows was bought as an investment. And all of us, I mean, uh, would prefer maybe to have a park in our neighborhood. Although I can tell you, given the crime associated with parks in our city, you do not want a park below you, believe me. Uh, you go to any of our parks, you see drug activity, you see homeless living there. The parks are a, are a real uh, attraction for homeless and for other crime. And so I understand from the standpoint of someone living there, well, you know, a park would be better, it won't be all these people, well, you know. But there will be people, there will be people living in the parks. We spent numerous amount of time um, going through parks when we had the personnel to do it and clean the, the homeless out and the drug dealers. I, I don't think you want to park next to your residential area. Um, we do have, um, Mr. Fuller, um, if you wanted to speak one last time. Yes. I wanted to address the also, um, if you have any questions for Mr. Fuller or Mr. Penman, that can be done um, after the meeting or outside. Uh, we can't have conversation between two people in the audience. I want to address the issue about the carport, car enclosures and the versus garages. One of the big battles right now in the mobile home industry is financing. One of the big issues with financing is the fact that if a person decides to leave the park, they're entitled to take everything they've put there with them. Now, if you insist, when you insist on someone having a site-built garage, you're making a $30,000 investment in the property they don't own. So if they decide they want to move their home, vacate, the way this has been designed is so that the homeowner has control. Everything we're installing can be dismantled and taken with them. And everything that, and furthermore, since that includes it in that, they can get financing for these things. Many lenders are shying completely away from financing site-built garages in chattel non fee simple parks. Quite frankly, the cost is prohibitive. We want to make these things affordable. We want good people. These people are going to be qualifying for loans. They're going to be qualifying. In fact, mobile home financing is tougher than even residential financing because there's only like two or three companies throughout the country. Also, the parks are brutal because of the change in laws after 07, 08. It's against the law to rent to someone who can't triple prove that they can afford this. So as, as a mobile home dealer, and I suppose I'm also a mortgage broker, specialized in mobile homes for 20 years, it's harder to get someone to a mobile home park these days than to get them a house. So the fears that they're going to fill up a riffraff just don't exist. But these things are designed so that being true to the concept of chattel financing and chattel parks, everything that they install, if they decide to pull their unit out and go someplace else, can be taken with them. I think it's completely unfair to require someone to build something that they can't take with them. They're making a $30,000 investment to land they don't even belong, that doesn't even belong to them. That's wrong. Thank you. Thank Mr. You, Mr. Fuller, before you go, um, just a quick question. Um, if the proposed project is approved and moved forward, what is your proposed timeline for development of the, the actual development site? Well, um, we're hoping, uh, Mr. Butler, Mr. Buster's here, we're hoping hopefully by probably late spring, early summer. Yes. And how long will it take to complete construction once started? Well, um, it will be done in phases, obviously, because these homes, you know, a lot of these homes from yesteryear would come in on, you know, one or two axles. Uh, you, and if you want to see what's in a mobile home, you would look at how many axles it has. Because it, it, back in the day, an average home had maybe two, three axles tops. Now they're averaging five to eight. They're heavy. They're drywall. They're built like they're built in four, two by four construction, sometimes two by six. The, home, the park will be filled in phases. In other words, we're going to do the phases to get the homes in there without the homes being landlocked. So obviously we're going to systematically go through the park, look at the map, and fill the spaces that can't, that will prohibit other homes coming in first. 
Thank you. And then also, um, I also had a concern as, uh, in regards to the build and, and the structure of, mm -hmm. of course, I'm sure as, you, as, you heard, as you've heard from some of the residents um, about some of the previous fires that have ravaged the city of San Bernardino, specifically in the Foothills area. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak a little bit about some of the fire protections or some of the clearance that you've received from traffic and engineering to ensure that there is adequate uh, space for fire resources and public safety resources in the event of a natural disaster or emergency. And as far as the structures that are being built, are they also going to be flame retardant and be able to withstand uh, certain types of uh, fire incidents that may happen or earthquake or flood? Uh, first of all, they're better than anything else on the market because they've got the roofs or architectural type. They've got hardy board, which is a cement product instead of the old heart, which would, instead of the old. T-111 masonite instead of the old uh, Alcan uh, siding. They're drywall inside. They've got their design to be much more sustainable. So you really can't compare what was built under the old DMV rules to what's being built now. Because like I said, in the, we, we can take these same homes and put them on land and get financing from them through FHA, Calvet, that kind of stuff. It's a much different construction. It's not complicated. These are, these are hardcore two by four 16 inch and center structures, houses. And I want to make one other point. I live in one myself because as a former Air Force officer, I'm a fanatic about safety. These things go down the highway at 70 miles an hour and don't fall apart, which means they have massive earthquake resist resiliency, which some of the site built houses don't even have. These homes are built with, with engineers so that they can take a good shake, rattle, roll and survive. They're designed so that if there's any, dest any destruction because of, the af because of the effects, they're easy to access the utilities, the plumbing, that kind of stuff, which means they'll be put back in action and livable much faster than how the older homes are built and, how, and definitely how the, ho how the houses are built. So we're really looking at the product. That, you know, all it takes is for a nasty earthquake to make everybody in here believers about manufactured housing by the way they're built. They're designed to take a beating. Like, like, I, said, like I said, they go on their freeway 70 miles an hour and they, not even a window pops out. As far as the, uh, uh, we have to conform to the fire rules as far as fire truck access. That's all baked into the, into the deal. But they are much better than the older product, much better. So as far as fire safety, we're talking about a whole different ball, ball game. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Anyone else wishing to speak? Commissioner Wilbert? <clears throat> yes, uh, once this project's complete, uh, have we done an analysis of uh, the tax base that this will give the city on, a, on an annual basis? What will the, uh, the taxes do, or what is the amount? Do we have a, an estimate of that? There, there was not a uh, study like that prepared for this, um, but perhaps uh, the applicant might know that information. The taxes on this property will be significantly increased from the bare land that's been there really Mr. forever. Mr. Penman, if Mr. Fuller can actually answer the question. Oh, oh I'm yes. not sure if he has the answer. Oh, Maybe he yes. does have it. <laughs> the other thing I was going to say, I was involved with the um, fire access, and the fire department insisted on a fire access road being constructed immediately south of the park and adjacent to it, and that is going to be done by the, by the developer. The way they calculate the taxation is that it's only 1% of the sales price. So if you have an $80,000 unit, then the tax loan is going to be $800 a month. You have a $130,000 unit, because it's all based on what, it, so what, the, what the original uh, purchase price was. So it's all, you know, and that's homeowners. We've been vetted because of park application, because of loan application. And that you can't get, you won't be able to get any other project where you can have that much revenue, tax revenue, uh, such a small space. That's one of the advantages. That's why a lot of cities want additional manufactured housing. Can we answer, though, what the actual, can we estimate at this point what the actual <coughs> benefit tax-wise is going to be for the city when it's all said and done? Well, I would say on the baseline, if you go to $80,000 as a baseline, 51, that's, eight, that's 800 bucks a year per house per time 51 with the local property tax. And this is paid for by the... If I, if I may, commissioners, the, uh, the city, um, the property taxes that are collected go to the county um, per an agreement that was done for fire protection. 
so we really can't at this point or right tonight say what the city does not benefit from property tax okay it, right. as it relates to its general as it relates to its general fund I understand okay so is there a tax benefit for the city for this project it would only be for the sales of the unit itself yeah, and the, people the sales tax okay thank you you're welcome right. anyone else wishing to speak commissioners of the audience yes um, if you'd like to come up, if you could state your name and address for the record. My name is Ron Kissling. I live at 4013 Piedmont Avenue in, San, in Highland, California. Perfect. Yes. I guess uh, I understand. I don't agree with almost everybody here. Uh, it's a very condensed living area and uh, I don't know if you can guarantee that they're absolutely fireproof Not just fire. okay secondly the, the tax benefit that was just brought up here so the taxes support the fire department police and services but technically the people they're only renting in those areas right No. they buy the home but they still pay for a lease on the lot. That is correct. So if they don't pay the rental fee on the lot, what happens to the home? They get, re get repossessed and it gets resold. But they bought the home. But they did not buy the land. It's chattel, non civil. Right. I mean, they own, they own the property. It's considered a stick. Okay. Home. So I guess the question is, for me, and the problem is that I don't think there has been enough studies done on this. Secondly, it doesn't benefit the city tax-wise. You're right. It, we don't want low-income housing in there. But for some reason, the only two choices are mobile homes or apartments. Those are the only choices. And that's because... All the are going to invest money there. If you're not going to put a gas station in or a market or anything. No. But why couldn't single-family dwellings be put there? If I may, um, they're, they're really, it's inappropriate to have dialogue between the, okay. between the podium and the, you could, if you'd like to step outside and have your conversations, I guess, I guess that's appropriate. So my concern is that, again, there hasn't been enough time to study this. The notices were sent out, were short, I, I, I consider it short notice. Um, I don't know if uh, any environmental studies have been done for that, and okay, so... Um, I guess the main concern is that I too would like to table this until there's been further investigation on how one it benefits the city, how the services like the fire department, police are going to uh, benefit from no taxes that support those at this point, and uh, thirdly, it's it's a rental property. So, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Wilbert. I uh, was just thinking, uh, this you know, 51 units uh, on rental property and mobile home, Do uh, does the city get any kind of credits for increasing housing uh, from our wonderful Sacramento? Yes, we do. It counts? We, uh, we've, you, you may have heard the term RENA, Regional Housing Needs Assessment, where the, uh, the, the state of California and through the local, uh, uh, through SCAG, Southern California Association of Governments, they um, they establish a um, housing unit number for every city in the state of California. Uh, we're working on our current allocation uh, for the for the next seven years, um, and so every year we report to the state how many units were were one um, approved or entitled, um, started construction, and finaled. In, 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 in that in that year and so we we do that um, annually and so um, uh, this 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 would be a project that would that would qualify that not just in the unit count but also from the affordability index even though there aren't any covenants as it relates to age restrictions and those kind of things if the applicant um, proposes and is approved under a certain premise that being um, 55 and older for seniors then we, we would we would take we would take credit and there's a there's there's formulas where 
you know, a certain percentage of your of your arena number, if you will, has to be, you know, low income, moderate, and 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 and, and market rate um, housing. So we we try to keep track of that the best that we can, and and this is one one way that we can achieve that. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments? Uh, I have just a quick question for staff. So moving forward, as this uh, project for development type PA 18-06 uh, is proposed, um, would you guys agree that this would be the highest and best use um, for this actual parcel? I mean, that's a pretty bold statement to me, but um, it is zoned for multifamily um, housing. So it's not really an appropriate area to have single family housing, especially as we are trying to meet those density numbers, those RENA numbers, um, to be compliant with state regulations. Um, so I would say this is pretty close to about the best use that you could get on this particular parcel. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, I was recently looking at the RENA numbers as well. and. Um, I'm glad to hear that it will check both categories within those quotas uh, that we also need to meet. I know the uh, governor has just recently uh, released a very bold uh, housing agenda uh, to help combat the uh, housing shortage crisis that's going on. And there's been instances where the Sacramento is going and they're suing municipalities uh, for not approving uh, projects that would help alleviate some of the housing a shortage in stock that's going on within the city. So uh, I just, that was just one of my main concerns, just making sure that we're addressing some of the pressing issues that are going on in the city and also that this project is in line with some of our state guidelines moving forward in regards to RENA. So thank you. Commissioner Coyle? No? You're good? Okay. If we have no one else wishing to speak on this item, I will actually close public hearing. And I will entertain a motion for item number four. I'd like to make a motion approving agenda item number four. I will second that. All right. We have a motion and we have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? The motion passes. Right. Right. Uh, moving on to item number five. Madam Chairman, oh, I yes. will have to abstain from that item. Yes. I, All I, right. I, so, so for the record, uh, Commissioner Quill has abstained for item number five. We're just going to wait for the room to clear a little bit. Uh, item number five is sign program 19-02. Uh, this is a proposal for um, an electronic message center sign in an existing church. The sign itself is actually going to be, um, or the panel is going to be placed on an existing monument sign um, at the corner of the property. Um, so. The only thing that we require the sign program for is because it's a digital um, so sign face. Um, but let's see, tw about 23 square feet uh, is the size of the monument sign, six feet in height. 65% um, of the sign area will utilize um, changeable copy. Um, again, this is an existing religious facility. Um, and the intention for the sign is really to advertise only on-site um, activities. They're, they're not going to be advertising uh, for Chevrolet or somebody else. Um, the property is located on the northeast corner of Atlantic Avenue and Palm Avenue, um, just a little bit south of Highland Avenue on the east side of the city. Uh, basic layout of the church. Um, the sign is going to be right at that corner, uh, the, the bottom left-hand corner, um, where the sign is actually already placed. You can see the existing sign down in the bottom right corner here, um, and they're basically just changing it out so that you have a digital um, display on the sign. Um, 
that's basically it. Uh, for the most part, they're, they're just going to be following all of the city's um, sign codes um, and as it relates to um, signage. So nothing really unusual there. And uh, that concludes my presentation unless there's any questions. Uh, but our recommendation is for the Planning Commission to adopt resolution 2019-071, find the approval of signed program 19-02 to be categorically exempt from CEQA pursuant to section 15303 for new construction or conversion of small structures and section 15311 for accessory structures of the CEQA guidelines and approve signed program 19-02 based on the findings of fact and subject to the conditions of approval. I need to take questions. Perfect. Um, I hereby open public hearing for item number five. If there's uh, anyone wishing to speak on this item. If not, uh, oh. If I could have you state your name and address for the public record. Yeah, Gary Quill, Quill Brothers Signs, 272 South I Street, San Bernardino. Uh, thank you, Chantel. That was a good presentation. Uh, we worked with the planning department to come up with a design that I feel is very attractive for the church, attractive for the surrounding area. It's certainly a far lot better looking than the existing sign, and we're in agreement with all the conditions. It does have automatic dimming. Right. Uh, it'll only be for on-site advertising. And I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, no, just a quick comment. I think it's a good design, and uh, thank you for your work. Appreciate it, Gary. Yeah, I have a question. The uh, electron is to promote the church activities and so forth, not a commercial. Yes, exactly. Yeah, on-site advertising only, and another little caveat. If we run into an emergency for, for fires or anything, they're great for putting comments out there for the public to see, you know, uh, shelters, Amber Alerts, things like that, that they're helpful to be used for also. But it would be primarily on all site, on site advertising. It is zoned for residential, moderate, I guess. How close are the residents around the church? Across the street? Well, you've got the freeway on one side. Uh, you got a couple houses, I believe, across the street on Palm. Mm -hmm. um, the sign's going to be basically facing the freeway, though, yeah. on that corner. Okay. So, so uh, if you look down at the um, the display on the on the bottom there, um, the sign is basically right on that corner. Okay. You do have residences across the street on Atlantic, and you also have residences across the street on Palm, but the sign won't be in the direct line of sight of any residences. So um, brightness of the sign would not be, it's not going to be flashing into my bedroom no, window? No, no, okay. no. It, sh it shouldn't be, and um, they, they are required to dim um, the, the lights if there's, you know, fog conditions or anything like mm -hmm. that. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, Chantel, thank you. This is great. Uh, if there's no one else wishing to speak on this item, I will close public hearing and I will entertain a motion. I'd like to motion to approve agenda item number five. Okay. I'll second. Perfect. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? The motion passes unanimously. Congratulations. Moving on to the Planning Commission reports and announcements. Do we have anything, Oliver? Yes, I do, actually. Um, I wanted to kind of make a, a, a proud moment announcement. I just wanted to announce to the commissioners and those in the audience that um, Chantal has recently uh, successfully passed the um, AICP certification, the Associ American Association for its... And, um, so she's, uh, she's officially a planner now, I guess, or certified. Uh, um, got a bit, a bit very proud. Um, Chantal's been here, I think, since 2013 or so. It started as an intern, and she's uh, worked her way through that. She's an associate planner now, and um, she's, she's done a fantastic job. I don't need to 
share that with you, but it's 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 very it's very exciting. For, I, I was going to call it a proud papa moment kind of a feeling, but it's it's it, she's she's done well, and I'm very proud of her. Just wanted to make that announcement this evening. Congratulations. Congratulations. Okay. Um, is there any other announcements from the commissioners? Yes, um, I have just one quick announcement. Um, I'm putting on a toy drive for the city of San Bernardino on uh, December 14th. Uh, right now we have one drop-off location at Starting 5 Barbershop, which is at uh, 2348 uh, Sterling Avenue in San Bernardino. Um, cross streets, I believe, is uh, Sterling and Highland. So if you guys had no any... Um, extra toys or anything that you can go and drop off there uh, we certainly appreciate it uh, the toy drive is going to be on uh, December 14th at the starting five barbershop at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, it's going to be our second <laughs> annual second year we're doing this um, last year we've helped hundreds of families uh, this year we're looking to do exactly the same hopefully more uh, so yeah um, appreciate you uh, your support and that's all I have for today can we start dropping off now? oh yes definitely yeah it's set up now <laughs> so thank you Yep. Any other comments from the commissioners? Um, I do actually have one. Uh, the week of December 10th through the, I believe, the 14th, 15th, um, the Ho Ho Parade will be going on. So go to your local park. There's going to be Santa. There'll be kids and events like that for the children. Uh, if you want to help out or donate, anything like that, most people are really happy, happy and welcome to to receiving that. Um, on the 12th, there will be um, a Ho-Ho Parade at the Lytle Creek Park on Wednesday, so please come. All right. So at this point, yes? I have one quick announcement for the commission. Um, I'm happy to say that it's that time of year again where we start planning for Arts Fest. <laughs> so Arts Fest 2020 is slated for March 14th from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. The application and submittal forms are all online on the city website. I can definitely send out the information to all the commissioners. That way you can share it, encourage people to apply and join. We are bringing it back to downtown at Court Street. So uh, we'll be able to bring in um, a lot of the local street food vendors to help promote local business. Uh, we're working with the school district again and Valley College to bring in artists and performing artists. So we're really proud of the fact that we get to bring it back for its fifth year. And just one last comment for commissioners and everything. Um, you guys have done an amazing job, and I just want to kind of thank everyone for kind of reading their agenda and, you know, asking staff if that on their own time with that if there's any clarifications needed. So I just wanted to throw out a thank you for, for being invested. All right. And then, um, so then we'll just move on to the adjournment. Uh, do I have a person who would motion for... I'd like to make a motion. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> I'd like to make a motion to adjourn until December 10th. Perfect. All right. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No. No one opposed. All right. <laughs> have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.